we're all familiar with the mechanism of sex determination in humans. Uh, females have two X chromosomes. Uh, males have an X and a Y. Uh, if you inherit an X chromosome from your mother and an X chromosome from your father, you're a female. However, if you X inherit an X chromosome from your mother and a Y chromosome from your father, you're a male. Different sex determination systems uh, determine uh, gender in, uh, in different species. Uh, gender is a term that we use to identify individuals on the basis of the gametes that they produce. Individuals that produce the larger stationary or immodal gametes, we assign the, the gender of female. Individuals who produce the small motile gametes, we call males. What they have for underlying genetic sex determination uh, can be highly variable. For example, if you look at spiders, uh, males are uh, XO, not XY. They're missing a Y chromosome. So XO is a male, XX, the homogametic sex, uh, they are females. In butterflies, it's a little more variable. The males get two of the same chromosomes. We call those Z chromosomes. They're, so they're ZZ. And the females can either be ZW, they have two different sex chromosomes, or they can be Z not, no chromosomes. So they can be absent one of the chromosomes, as the case of the, the uh, male spiders. But this is, in this case, it's female butterflies. Uh, it, the birds, they have a, uh, a system whereby the males are the homogametic sex. They get two identical chromosomes. And the females are the heterogametic sex. They get two different chromosomes. Clownfish can change sex. They can go from being a female to a male or a male to a female, depending upon the environment that they're in and the sexual competition that they're, that they're encountering. Turtles, uh, sex is determined in turtles by the temperature of the soil in which the eggs develop. So it's a very a completely external signal that determines whether they develop into a male or a female. In 1945, Johannes Gertsen proposed that male honeybees have no fathers. He determined this by doing a series of experiments um, where he had uh, colonies where the queens had not mated, uh, and he found that they still produced males. So he figured that the, there was no fathers because the queens hadn't mated, therefore um, they had to be have the males derived uh, uh, without being cut, the eggs not being inseminated. Uh, the pictures I have there are, it's a place in Germany that we stayed, and I was gonna tell you a side story, but I, I'll make it real brief. The, the person who owned the place where we're staying there, uh, his wife's great, great, great uncle was Johann Gertsen. And one afternoon she showed us all those medals there that you see on his chest. Um, she had them in a box and uh, showed them to us. But Gertsen can be considered the, the father of honeybee genetics. And not only when he discovered the sex determining system of honeybees being uh, one where uh, females have a father and males don't. Uh, it was the first proposed sex determination system for any animal. Honeybees have a haplodiploid mechanism of, of, of sex determination. Um, Haplodiploidy is not rare. 20, about 20% of all animal species have this particular kind of sex determining system. Uh, as you can look, look at the figure, you can see that females uh, are derived from uh, the egg of the mother and the sperm of the father, and they have two sets of chromosomes. They get one set from the mother, one set from the father, whereas males uh, only have one set of chromosomes, the set that they inherited from their mother. So you see the male on the lower left, that's the phenotype that comes about after it develops. And on the right, you get the females, which can either be queens or workers, depending upon the, 
the uh, nutritional feeding program that they get while they're developing. In 1933, P.W. Whiting proposed uh, a, a mechanism whereby one gene is responsible for determination of sex in braconid wasps, which is what he studied. He did studies and he, he found that some of the individuals that were, that were produced were diploid males. I mean, he knew it was high, that they were haplodiploid. So I mean, he expected there were, that males would all be haploid, like with honeybees, one set of chromosomes, and females would be diploid. But when he started looking closely, he found that, in fact, uh, some of the males that were produced had two sets of chromosomes. So he figured out the only way this could happen is if there's a, a in the way that they segregated, it had to be one gene responsible for determining sex. And he determined that in order to be a female, you had you were heterozygous for this gene. You had two different alleles of this gene. And if you had the two of the same, you were a diploid male. In this case, the diploid males survived that they couldn't reproduce because their, their, their sperm weren't viable uh, for uh, uh, passing on offspring. In 1951, um, Otto Mackensen, uh, he was also the, one of the developers of the instrumental insemination technology shown on the right. He proposed that, in fact, honeybees have a similar system. And he proposed that, um, that a queen that was mated to a drone that had a sex allele that matched one of her two would produce 50% diploid males. Uh, so half of their brood would be homozygous and half would be heterozygous. And the diploid males, he said, were lethal. He thought they just died. So he called it lethal, lethal genes. And he determined this when he did these crosses because here on the left, you see the, the brood pattern of a queen that um, uh, received a sex allele that was diff different from either of the ones that she had. Uh, and on the right, you see the brood pattern of one who received a uh, it was inseminated by a male that had a sex allele that was identical to one of her two. So in this case here, you got 50% loss of brood. Over here, you don't have the loss of brood. So the, what, the one on the right was called shot brood. And that was one way of determining whether you had um, uh, a queen who had mated with uh, too many males that had sex alleles similar to hers. So then he went on and showed that if you, if you look at this series, um, that there's a whole series of alleles. He called it a lethal series of alleles. Uh, on the left, you have this queen. She has X1, X2. Those are her two sex alleles. They're different. She's heterozygous. And she mated with a male that's an X, X1 male. So with the X1 male, if you look down at the bottom here, it's homozygous, produces diploid males. She also mated with uh, X3, X4, X5, say. And if you look at the, um, the offspring that are derived from them, uh, they don't produce diploid males. So he, he looked at this and he determined there's got to be a whole set of these different alleles uh, in some sort of an allelic series. But again, he called them lethal. It was a lethal series. In 1963, Jerzy Wojka, a Polish uh, apicultural scientist, uh, did a really clever experiment. He started looking at larvae, drone larvae, of different, different ages, and he discovered that when they're first hatched from the egg, he could, he could look at the drone larvae and he could make a distinction with those that were, that were apparently diploid. Then if you looked later, uh, they were missing. So right after hatching, you could, you could find larvae that were different and were distinguished, that were diploid males, and then they disappeared. So you never saw any diploid males. So then he was curious, are they lethal? Do they die? Or was it something else happened? So he took those larvae, the, the, the newly hatched larvae of drones uh, in drone cells, and he grafted those larvae into cells like this that are used for raising queens. When he put them in those queen cells and gave them back to the bees, 
the bees actually continued to feed them. They didn't kill them. And then after about three days, he took those larvae out of the cells. They were being raised in the queen cells. And he put them back into cells uh, in, in drone comb, give it back to the bees, and they raised them. And when they came out, they were diploid males. He, he did genetic studies and showed that they were, in fact, diploid. So he came to the conclusion, it's not a lethal series. What's happening is, is the viable diploid males are being consumed by the nurse bees shortly after they hatch. The nurse bees can detect differences between the haploid males and the diploid males, and they eat the diploid males, so you never see them unless you go to this trouble of, uh, of producing them. In 2003, Martin Baia, the guy on the right, uh, published a paper in, uh, in Cell. I actually was an author on it too, uh, where we had identified the complementary sex determining gene named it CSD, the single gene that was responsible for um, determining uh, the sex and gender of, uh, of honeybees. And in subsequent studies, Martin showed that in a population altogether, this allelic series consists of, in one, the one population he studied, 19 different alleles. So there were 19 different forms of this one gene. And in combination with each other, he found that um, there were 171 active combinations of these, these 19 different sex alleles. In other words, if you put, if you put A1 with A3, uh, it was a viable female. If you put A1 with A4, it was a viable, but maybe A1 with A18, even though they were, they were different alleles when you sequenced them, they were actually functioning as if they were the same gene. Um, but anyway, he went through all these combinations and he found out that all in all, there were 19 inactive combinations and 171 active combinations that gave you diploid females and not diploid males. So for this section, this is population genetics. And I, I, it's important in understanding kind of the effects of, of the sex determining system on populations. Uh, I have here, this is a thinking cap. You need to put this on. Uh, this is a little bit more dense, a little more difficult to understand the concepts, but we'll get through it anyway. We'll try. So how do you maintain so many different sex alleles in a population? And each of these sex alleles in a population tend to go towards equal frequency. So if you have 10 sex alleles, they tend to all be one-tenth frequent or something, or something close to that. So they, they tend to reach an equilibrium state of being equally frequent. If you have five, they're equally frequent. Each one of them is, is uh, present in the population at one-fifth. Um, so how does that come about? Well, it comes about because selection favors rare alleles. So an allele that's rare will, in combination with the other alleles, less often produce a diploid male because there just aren't that many copies of it out there. So overall, in the beginning, when there's a lot of them around, they're really favored. And so the frequency of that allele will increase in the population from one generation to the next. Ones that are too frequent, too often, when, when you match you, you, a queen mates, if she's got a really common allele, she will too often mate with another male that has an allele like hers, th that common allele. And then those individuals will will not be viable females. They will be diploid males that are consumed by the workers and eliminated from the population. On well, the upper left, we show that's a, that's a drone congregating area. Uh, there's a, a comet of drones in there. And this just shows the different mixture of, of sex alleles. Let's say most of these drones have the A1 sex allele, okay? The queen flies through this drone congregating area. She mates with drones, mates with different males. And then she comes back to the colony and she starts laying eggs. Um, so assuming the, man, the, the female was A1, A2, she has two different sex alleles, she has to. And say she mated with uh, five males, three A1s and an A2 and an A3. Then the progeny resulting from the combination of her two sex alleles that go into a eggs, one, in, one, one sex allele into each egg, but they, they get distributed across the eggs, in combination with the sperm 
from the five different males gives you these genotypes uh, derived from it. As you can see, the more of the A1 genotypes are eliminated uh, than the others. Uh, so there's going to be selection in this case that's going to be selection against the A1s and in favor of the A2, A3s. So in the next generation, there's going to be fewer A1s and more A2s and A3s. So what's the probability of a matched mating when the queen flies through a drone crown gear? What's the probability she's going to mate with a male that has one like hers? Let's assume there's 10 sex alleles in the population, and they're equally frequent. So you have X1 through X10. Each one of those is present at a frequency of 10%. The queen has two different sex alleles. Let's just say X3, X6. Each time she mates, there's a 20% chance she will mate with a matching allele. She has two different ones, and each of them in the population are at 10%. So that's each time she mates, there's a 20% chance the male she mates with will have an allele identical to one or the other of hers. Matings with a matching male produces 50% diploid drones. So every time she mates with one at a, you know, a chance of 20% chance for each mating, and there's a 20% chance that there will be 50% brood viability derived from that particular male that she mated with. So if she mates one time, there's a 20% chance that she will lose 50% of her viable brood due to homozygosity at the sex locus. There's an 80% chance that she'll mate with one that has a different allele from hers and she'll have 100%. This figure demonstrates what happens as you increase matings. The upper left-hand corner, that's a queen mates. There's 10 sex alleles. They're equally frequent. Queens mate one time. In this population, queens that mate, if you look at queens that mate one time, 20% of them will have 50% brood viability, 80% of them will have 100. If you go to mate two times, now there's three different classes. If you mate, if you mate with um, two males that have matching, matching alleles to yours, uh, the probability of that is, is relatively low. Uh, if there's three matings, uh, you would have 50% brood viability. If you, if you mated with one male that has a matching allele and one male that doesn't, you're going to have 75%. That's a little higher probability. And if you mate with two males, neither one of which uh, have an allele that matches one of yours, then it's a probability of 60-something percent. So you can see how the number of matings affects the distribution of brood viability in different colonies across the population. And then when you get up to 10, 10 matings, there's a very low probability that you're going to get um, uh, enough matching matings. You're going to have very low, low brood viability. And uh, there's a probability, reasonable probability, that you're going to have uh, matings with males who are going to give you a uh, reasonably high viability of brood. This is important for understanding the evolution of polyandry, for the evolution of um, one of the hypotheses for the evolution of polyandry, multiple mating of queens.